you'll open uh, your Bibles to Matthew 21, we're going to continue uh, in our series in Matthew, uh, and we're going to start with uh, the triumphal entry uh, today. It's interesting that uh, last month we were focusing on the first week of Christ's life on the earth, incarnate, in the flesh, and uh, this very beginning of January we're going to start looking at the very last week of Christ on this earth, and uh, we'll focus in on, on Him uh, as He moves through His final week leading to His resurrection. And I think it's kind of fitting uh, that this particular sermon starts on uh, the day that marks the beginning of a new year. Last night, it was like marking the end of the old year. And the new year, to me, always seems to be a, a bit of a paradox, because on one hand, we're like eagerly anticipating doing things better than we did the year before, while on the other, the future sometimes is filled with a bit of anxiety and worry, and uh, so it's kind of difficult. Uh, because you see, we all want to try to make those resolutions, those commitments for the new year, and yet the days ahead might be difficult, and so it's difficult to get those resolutions off the page and, and kind of going. Sometimes... Uh, we've uh, kind of suffered through some hardships, and I don't know if 2016 was that for you. I was kind of looking at some different people's messages. Some was, uh, 2016 was amazing. I grew so much. I met so many new people. It was so amazing. I can't wait till th 2017. Some messages were, I don't think 2016 could have been any worse, and surely 2017 can't be that bad, so I will forge on through to the new year. I don't know uh, where you are, but as Jesus begins this last week, known as his passion, he faces some pretty pressure-packed situations. I mean, when you look at his life, his friends have totally proved themselves not to be dependable. His daily life is scrutinized on every hand by his enemies, and his private life is constantly interrupted. The weight of the sacrifice that he's about to make probably caused a lot of strain in the life of Christ. We know this because as he goes in the middle of the week to the garden to pray, he literally sweats drops of blood asking God, perhaps there's a plan B. Maybe I don't have to go through all that is planned for me. Maybe there's a different way, but not your will, but my will be done. You see, Jesus kept his composure in spite of what he knew was going to be the most difficult week of his life. He communicated his, to his people what he wanted, what his will was. He completes his mission that God sent him to do, and he did it completely trusting in his heavenly Father to bring him through. So there's, there's a pretty good model for us as we move into the new year, right? No matter what we face, no matter what's happening, no matter what's going on, to face it with courage. So we're going to see three principles as we look at the life of Christ, as he enters into the city of Jerusalem for his final week on earth that we can follow to help us as we move in to 2017 and our future. The first point is that Jesus faced the future with courage. You remember when we left off, it was actually right before uh, December with uh, the message in Matthew, Jesus was leading his disciples out of Galilee, stopping his ministry there, and he was moving them toward the city of Jerusalem. Now, I tell you that as he was doing this, he, it was totally planned. He had been talking about his hour all through his life and his ministry. He knew his hour was going to be the day of his death when he was going to die on a cross. So he knew what he was doing and where he was going, and he was dictating every move. He was in control of every move that he was going to make. It wasn't the Pharisees, the scribes. It wasn't the priests that were going to dictate the end of the life of Christ. Jesus was doing it. He was in total control. If you look at Matthew 20, verse 18, it says, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered in the hands of chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and to crucify him, and on the third day he will be raised up. Commentator William Barclay said it was an act of glorious defiance and superlative courage for Jesus to go to Jerusalem. 
I mean, you'd think that perhaps Jesus would have slipped into the city unseen, but he didn't. In fact, he did just the opposite. If you look at Luke 9, 51, it says, when the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. I like what the King James says. It says he set his face toward Jerusalem. He wasn't going to the side. He wasn't retreating. He was going forward. His face was set toward what he was doing as he was heading to the holy city. Many people are reluctant to move into the days ahead. I mean, I've already mentioned that because it seems that the past behind us has been so hard and maybe we're not happy with our life today. And so we don't want to move forward. But you see, to stay the same is not an option. It's definitely not an option for a Christian. We need to accept the responsibility to change. But to do that, to get a different outcome, it means that we're going to have to make a lot of effort. And sometimes it's going to, to take going through a difficult time to get to a blessed time. I had a really good friend, I still know this person, who years ago I decided to confront them on a specific issue about their life. They were the most selfish individual that I'd ever met, still to this day. Tremendously selfish. I mean, you'd think the world revolved around them, center of the universe. So one day I got them aside at just the right moment and I mentioned the fact that they needed to change their life. Their selfishness was affecting them and everyone around them. And this is what they said to me. They said, I know I'm selfish and I know I need to change, but I'm not going to do it because it just takes too much work. Well, today they're still a friend, but not a close friend. Because once again, you can't stay the same, even though it may take a lot of work you need to make some changes in your life. Don't sit around feeling sorry for yourself and make everyone else miserable. My message to you is stop feeling sorry for yourself and with God's help, do something about your life. Make some changes with the power and the help of God. Follow the example of Jesus Christ. Even if things are different and looking difficult for the future, press on and make the most and the best of your life and your time and your opportunity. There was a little boy that was playing in his father's shop. An unfortunate accident happened and an awl got stuck in his eye. It got infected, the infection moved to the other eye, and eventually this little boy became totally blind. But Lewis Braille picked up another awl, poked some holes in some paper, and created a language where blind people can now read. And I say that's a little boy who pressed on, who made a difference, that made some changes, that faced his today and faced his tomorrow with courage. And we can do the same thing through our faith in a powerful God. God has called us to lead by example. As Christians, we are called to model what is right and to lead others into righteousness. Our goal is to be more like Jesus, which requires that we make changes on a regular basis. But we must take that first courageous step. You're never going to go anywhere if you don't make that first step. I would say to you that perhaps God today is calling you to lead your family a little differently this year. Maybe you need to downsize so that you can get control of your finances. Maybe you need to order your family just a little bit different so that you can teach them that Jesus Christ is the priority of your life and our family, and he is above every other thing. Or maybe you need to be a better witness at church or with, or excuse me, at work or with people that you are around every day. Maybe this is the year that you step up and take the responsibility to lead a covenant group in your home. Maybe you're saying, oh no, I'm not going to do that. that. That takes a lot of time and energy. I'm just not qualified. Maybe God is having you take a step of courage into this new year. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 says, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but of power and of love and of discipline. I think too many of us fail to lead because of the potential problems that may face us in the future. Think of what happens to the spirit-filled, 
spirit-led church of the living God, when so many people who have been brought to maturity have been in the church for many years, who honestly have great faith, but sit on the sideline, not stepping up and taking the leadership opportunity that is before them, leaving it to people that perhaps aren't mature enough, aren't ready for it, aren't really qualified to do it, and they have to take that position and the church limps on. Before you refuse a position of authority, maybe you need to just remember all of the blessings that await you when you do. Because you see, there's gratification when you make a contribution that's positive for the world and for the church and for your Lord. There's a satisfaction in knowing that you're doing the will of God and that you're blessing others' lives and others' lives will be blessed when you step up, when you come out of the woodwork, when you take a place. There's the energy that comes from knowing that the Holy Spirit that dwells within you will fill you and will empower you to do the work that He's called you to do. I've even experienced the fact that He will give you words to say in just the moment that you need the words to say. Selflessly serving in the kingdom enhances growth in your relationship with God and it produces fruit in your life. And we know that fruit is of great worth in the eyes of God. You remember Moses in the Old Testament when God came to him and told him he wanted him to step up, take a place of leadership and bring his people out of Egypt? Do you remember that Moses made all kinds of excuses why he couldn't do that? I mean, he had remembered about 40 years earlier when he tried to free one of the Israelites and that didn't work out so well, ended up in murder and him fleeing into the wilderness. And so rather than take the place of leadership that God wanted him to take, he preferred staying miles and miles away from Pharaoh's palace in a wilderness, just tending sheep. So what does God do? Well, he gives him the credibility that he needs by enabling him to do all these miracles to prove who he's from. He couldn't speak very well, so he brings his brother Aaron beside him to be the spokesperson, and God trusted Moses to be the leader, and then Moses trusted God to lead him. And he took that place of leadership, and I think the Israelites were pretty glad that he did because he brought them out of bondage and led them to the promised land where God gave them a land of their own and made them his people. Well, I think that we should be glad that Jesus stepped up and took his place of leadership his place of authority in following through in the will of God in his life and saving us. We should be grateful. Well, the second thing that I want you to notice is that Jesus was praised by the multitudes, but he received the honor graciously. Jesus faced the future with humility. Matthew 21, 8 says, And most of the multitudes spread their garments in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. And the multitudes going before him and those who followed after were crying out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, this is not a spontaneous parade. This is a planned event carefully executed by our Lord. Everything about the triumphal entry points to the absolute sovereignty of Jesus Christ. Notice several things that he did prior to and during this triumphal entry to demonstrate exactly who he was and what he was called to do. The first thing he did was he performed a spectacular miracle just before the triumphal entry. You see, Jesus had recently been in Bethany with some very good friends of his, and there he had raised one of those friends, Lazarus, from the dead. He had been dead for four years, and when Jesus Christ resurrected him from the dead, the whole area was buzzing with excitement about it, with the news that a man who'd been dead for four days was given life. John 12, 9 says, the large crowd of the Jews then learned that he was there and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priest planned to put Lazarus to death also because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. You see, the, the raising of Lazarus just before the final week of Jesus placed a laser focus on him. 
I mean, all of the people were buzzing about him. Most of the Hebrew families were probably debating on whether or not he was the Messiah. And the Pharisees, they were just angry and mad and hated him and resented him and wanted to get rid of him. So secondly, Jesus arranged this parade during the Passover week. Now, if you know anything about Passover, you'll know that in the Jewish calendar, it is the most sacred event, the most sacred time of their whole year. It was a festival that they had, and in Jerusalem, during the day of Christ, about two million people had come into the city. I mean, they were camping inside the city, outside the city. They were everywhere. And Jesus uses this perfect time to reveal himself as the Messiah, so that the most people would see him and that no one would miss it. He indeed was King Jesus. So third, Jesus excited the crowd by deliberately fulfilling prophecy. This is a part of him manipulating this whole event. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 had predicted that when the Messiah comes, he will ride into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. Matthew 21, 1 is the completion of that. Listen, when they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village opposite you and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them, bring them to me. And if anyone says something to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them and immediately he will send them. And that's exactly what happened? They brought the animal to Jesus, threw their cloaks on it, and as he rode down the Mount of Olives, everyone saw him and came running to him to give him praise. Now, the Mount of Olives is to the east in front of the old city of Jerusalem. In other words, it is opposite the eastern gate. Now, if you know anything about the second coming of Christ, you'll notice that Jesus Christ is going to come back to this earth through the eastern gate, the Bible says. And so there are a lot of people who have built above ground tombs and they're buried in there. Their thought is when Jesus comes through the eastern gate, they'll be the first to rise from the dead, the first to go into the kingdom. So it's a really cool area. And raising right up from those Uh, tombs, there is a Mount of Olives, and that's where Jesus prayed through the night. That's where he got on the colt, and that's where he started his ascent down the mountain and up the other side into the city of Jerusalem through the eastern gate. It's just majestic. And when people saw him coming toward the temple, they got so excited, they just exploded. They knew that he was openly declaring that he was the Messiah. So they rushed to the mount, they spread their own cloaks, they took tree branches, spread them on the road in front of him, and they all began to joyfully praise God, saying, Hosanna, which means save us now. This is in contrast to everything that Jesus had ever done In Matthew 21, 10, it says, And when he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the multitudes were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Notice fourth, Jesus accepted the praise of the people and encouraged their support. I know that a lot of you are students of the Word. I know because you're here at this church and most of you are here so that you can hear the Word of God preached unashamedly, nothing taken out, nothing added to. And so you know that as we preach, we see that Jesus often had to tell people to keep it quiet, the miraculous things that he would do, because he would say, it is not my hour yet. Don't tell them what I've done. Don't let them know how amazing I am, that I am the Messiah and I am the Lord, because I don't want to hurry up that Uh, contempt against me, but now he lets it all out. He doesn't want to hide it at all. Now he is openly proclaiming who he is. So now he is the Messiah, and that's what they're asking. And even with these people praising him by the thousands, and even as he's demonstrating his absolute sovereignty over all things, he still is maintaining his humility. He wasn't being manipulative, and he wasn't being arrogant. His spirit of authenticity and humility continued to amaze the people. I mean, 
If you look at Jesus riding into town on a donkey, that is quite a contrast to most kings when they victoriously rode into a city. I mean, a legitimate king in the first century, if he had conquered a people and he was going to triumphantly ride into the city, he would come in on a great white stallion or a a dark black stallion, something magnificent. And it wouldn't be people behind him waving uh, cloaks and, and branches. It would be an army. And they would have weapons gleaming in the sun. And there would be banners and there would be flags and there would be trumpets blaring and there would be the defeated people behind and here would come the parade. That's the way a legitimate king in the first century would enter into a city. But Jesus doesn't enter in that way. He is no ordinary king. Jesus enters into the city in peace on the back of a donkey in humility And therein is the power of Jesus Christ. Let me say that there is one very dangerous pressure that the future might hold for some of you. There's a really great, great pressure on people these days, and it is the hunger for appreciation. When I began my ministry many years ago, I was in a a full-time gospel group. It was an evangelistic group, did revivals and things, and it was a performance-based ministry. I mean, it was music, and we sang and played instruments, and eventually I began to preach. And one of the things that would happen quite often, I mean, all the time from a lot of people is people would say how wonderful you are and how great you are and how good you did and how amazing it is and on and on and on how their lives were changed. And I had a hard time accepting that praise. I had a hard time accepting uh, those, those, those words. And so I'd always try to block it. I would always try to push it off. I'd always try to say, well, no, not really. I, don't say that. It, just listen to what I said. And if you change your life, then all is good for me. And all this false humility and all of those kind of things. And my wife one day came up to me after listening to this for quite some time. And she finally just said, Jack, when someone says something nice to you, just say thank you. Get over with it. I said, yeah, I see your point. So it's just, just thank you. If you appreciated that, I thank you very much. Glory be to God. Because you see, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Success in any area can make people conceited. The applause of the crowd can create enormous ego problems. I tell you, I... I see that so much once again on on social media and Facebook. What we do is we post the best posts we possibly can post so we can get the most likes or the most comments. Then we feel better about ourselves. I mean, it's like we're all in a, a competition to see who had the best meal last night. And if you get the most likes, then, hey, you win the prize. You had the best meal last night. You posted your picture and it looked great and you win the prize. So now you feel better about yourself, and we seek that acclaim, and we seek that applause, and we seek that appreciation. But seriously, there are so many talented people here that it's a danger that if your sales are going up, or if your influence is expanding, or if your portfolio increases, be sure to keep a balance. Because for every action that someone gives positively toward you, There's always a reaction that's going to come from the other side that might not be so positive. For every compliment, there's always a critic waiting in the wings to pounce on you. And some of these same people who are crying out in praise, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord today, is going to cry out, crucify him later on in the week. So that leads to the third principle. Jesus faced the future with maturity. The religious leaders were appalled at this triumphal entry. 
In Luke 19, 39, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said, basically, Jesus, rebuke your disciples. They're claiming you're the Messiah. That's blasphemy. You've stepped over the line. You need to be responsible, and you need to tell those people to shut up, that they are not to cry out like that. We're going to be in trouble with Rome if you don't shut up. They're going to think that we are bringing in an insurrection to try to overthrow them if you're not careful. But Jesus refused to be intimidated by these objectors, and he said to them, I tell you the truth, if these become silent, then the stones will cry out. In other words, people need to have the opportunity to worship God. I think we need to come into corporate worship every week to gather together, to just enjoy the privilege that God has called us to give him praise, to sing our worship, to speak his praise to shout our joy in Him. People need to praise the Lord because God desires our praise. The Bible says He delights in the praises of His people. We used to sing a song way back in the day that used the King James Version of that Scripture, which is He inhabits the praises of His people. Think about that. You think that it's not a big deal if you don't come together as the people of God and sing and speak your praise to Him, that you just won't miss it, that it's not important? Listen, I tell you that when you come into this place, when we gather together in unity under the banner of the cross, in the name of Christ, we lift up our voices in praise. God lives in that praise. God's presence comes into your life. And if you don't feel it, then you need to get rid of yourself and you need to open your spirit to the living God who will fill you with his presence and all of the perfect gifts that come along with him. You see, if we don't praise him, Jesus says that the created objects of nature will. In other words, I would much rather see your smiling faces and your tears streaming down your cheeks than a whole bunch of rocks sitting in here singing praise to God. But that's what he said would happen. Romans 8, says, we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. The Bible says that the heavens declare the glory of God. How do they do that? When they shine, when they do what they were created to do, That declares the glory of God. And you were created to worship God. And when you do what you were created to do and you worship Him, then you glorify God and He inhabits your praises. So even while Jesus quoted Scripture, these detractors still plotted against Him. You see, anyone who faces their future determined to do God's will must be mature enough to understand that not everybody is going to approve. We've seen a lot of um, approval ratings through politics. I've seen a lot of guys that have had 85% approval ratings, some some political ladies who've had 35% ratings, but I've never seen ladies or gentlemen who have ever received a 100% approval rating. Have you? I don't think it's ever going to happen. I am a little bit upset though. Facebook has got me, finally got me. Last week it showed this little, little post on my, my wall and it said that four friends have unfriended me this year. <laughs> I don't even want to know who they are. I don't know if I can go on in life now. Four people... We're upset at something that I did or said. Listen, Jesus said, woe to you if all men speak well of you. Because just when you think you've made everybody happy, you're probably being stabbed in the back. If you want to change your life for the better, you're going to have to make some decisions that won't please everyone around you. And you'll have to learn to endure criticism, listen, without overreacting. 
When I was in my ministry in Georgia several years ago, I had a man that came into my office, sat down on the other side of my desk, and he said, I don't like what you're preaching. You're preaching at me. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, it's like you're preaching right at me, and I don't like that. And I said, seriously, don't flatter yourself. I don't sit in here and think about you and then write a sermon to help you or, or, or put you down. He said, well, I just don't like what you're preaching. And I picked up my Bible and I handed it to him and I said, show me. And this is what he said. He put it down. He said, I don't know what's in there and I don't know where to go to find anything. And I said, and you're telling me what to preach. And then he looked at me, (laughs) you know, with those beady eyes. And he pointed his finger and he said, I don't like you. And then God came down from heaven into my heart and spoke the perfect words. Believe me, I didn't have them in me to say them. But here's what God said to him through me. I love you. And I'm sorry. And I got up and I walked around my desk and I walked over to him to hug him. And he put his hand up to hold me away. And he walked out of my office and out of the church. And I never saw him again. See, you're going to have critics. No matter what you say, no matter what you do, you could be a conscientious school teacher and there will be a parent who says you're too demanding. And at the same time, someone else will say you're too lenient. You can be a conscientious doctor and do everything for the best of the patient and you're still going to get somebody that's going to sue you. You can be the most generous employer of all and you're still going to have those people who are going to mumble about their salaries. You might find this hard to believe, but even preachers are subject to criticism on occasion. I mean, I'll give you some of them. Sermon's too long. All you talk about is money. No, you're too numbers conscious. Some pastors, just, you're just not evangelistic enough or friendly enough or you just want to control everything. I like this one. It's one of my favorite. Most preachers are lazy. After all, they only work one day a week. You don't even work all that day, just in the morning. I had one lady that came up to me about two years into one of my ministries, thank goodness elsewhere, and she looked at me and she said, I was here before you came, and I'll be here after you leave. So you just say whatever you want to say. An effective leader needs to rise above the criticism. And that takes maturity and confidence. J. Oswald Sanders said, Maturity is moving from a thick, thin skin and a hard heart to a thick skin and a soft heart. Luke 19.41 says, When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. J. Vernon McGee said, we probably shouldn't call this a triumphal entry. This is a tearful entry. How strange that the grand marshal of the parade stops the parade to cry. I don't know. I think that I can understand just a little bit of what was in the heart of God. When I think of what he left just a little over 33 years prior to this event. 33 of our years prior to Jesus weeping over Jerusalem, he had emptied himself of deity and he had wrapped himself in fleshly form. He had come down to this earth being born in a rough stable and laid in a manger through a little virgin girl And he was raised in a time when it wasn't really easy with all the conveniences to live, and he became a bond slave. He was a servant of all. And then he was getting ready to die on a cross. And as he sees the city, he weeps because of the rejection. They were rejecting him. And how that must have pained him to see the rejection and to see what that rejection was going to bring to them. Because you see, 
in 70 AD, Jerusalem was going to be ransacked by Rome. Jesus could see that. Verse 43 says, For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side and they will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Jerusalem, you didn't even recognize when God came down. I know that Jesus is always motivated by love, but I'm amazed at his faithfulness here. That Jesus, knowing that he was going to be rejected and spit upon and beaten, and mocked, and brutally crucified, stayed on that donkey, and continued that ride into that city. I'll tell you what, people will disappoint you. I know you've felt that. I know you've known that. I know that I have known that. And I'm sure that I have disappointed someone as well. But I tell you the truth that we need to look as Jesus looked on people, not with these two extremes. One, don't become cynical. Don't become bitter. Don't stop your journey with Christ. Don't give up on the people of God. Don't give up on the lost people of the world. They need your faithfulness. They need your leadership. They need your courage and your humility. And they need your maturity to see them as they really are and not give up on them. Continue to love them and help them, forgive them. But on the other hand, don't look naively on people either. It's very unrealistic when you close your eyes to what people are really like. Listen, sometimes we need to tell people the truth in love. You know, some people overlook gross sin in the lives of people that they love because they're afraid to tell them or they just don't want to believe that their person that they love is actually a sinner that needs the grace of God. You're the one to show them grace. Don't keep playing over their drunkenness, their alcoholism, their drug addiction. Don't do that. Don't overlook the sin of immorality in the lives of the people around you. Don't naively just think that it will go away. Look at people with the eyes of Christ, with love and with faithfulness, but look at them with truth and with justice. He, Jesus wasn't blind, he wasn't bitter, and he wasn't cynical. He assessed man's sinful condition accurately. He looked at Jerusalem. He wept over what their hard hearts would bring them, and yet still he had the grace and the maturity to go to the cross and die for those sinners. Do you see him? 1 Peter 2.21 speaks it for us. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow in his steps. Maybe if you would suffer for someone, maybe that example of love and faithfulness would be the thing that would change a life eternally. If you want to walk in God's will, and if you want your life to count for something, then there comes a time to make a decision, a time to step forward in faith and to face the future with Christ. It takes courage and humility and maturity because sometimes the future ain't easy. And it's not always filled with loving, supporting people. 
Sometimes you're out on a limb and you feel all alone. But I tell you that there is a friend that will be there closer than a brother to you. And more than that, there is a Christ who will go with you and in you and bear you up in the midst of your storm because there's something bigger at stake. It's the souls and it's the lives of men for eternity. Father, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for the love that you give us. And Father, we say that so many times that I pray that that doesn't become something that is void of meaning. For your love is higher than the mountains and deeper than the deepest sea and wider than the east is from the west. I pray, God, today that you will fill us with your love. That's going to take getting rid of us, dying to our conceit and our ego and our arrogance. It's going to take stepping up in boldness and courage instead of living in fear. And it's going to take making some changes to grow up and to mature in Christ, to move on to the deeper things of Jesus. And I pray, Father, that that will be our year this year. My prayer is not for ease and comfort and pleasure. My prayer is for faithfulness and strength and courage to live our lives in the pattern of our suffering Savior and of our victorious King. In His name I pray.